The following is an independently produced community access program. The viewpoints expressed are those of the community access producer and do not reflect those of Shaw Cable Systems. The program is presented in response to CRTC policy guidelines regulating community programming. On this segment of Art Glass today, I'm going to talk about the art of painting on glass. Uh, painting on glass is something I really enjoy doing. I really enjoy the history of it. Uh, I love the technique and I really love the finished product. Painting on glass is one of the oldest forms of stained glass technique. When you hear the word stained glass, it's not to do with the stain or the color of the glass. Glass color is made with different chemicals and minerals. The stain actually is the paint that's put on the glass and when it's fired in a kiln, it becomes a permanent part of it. So if you see a face or shading or imagery on, it, on a window, that's the stained glass part of it. A window made without the paint is just an art glass window. Well, not just an art glass window, but it's an art glass window. The, uh, the technique and tradition of painting on glass, it comes from medieval times. We use the same materials, we use the same techniques that were used in France, uh, the Chartres Cathedral. All of it is still the same. Uh, so that's why I, I really love it so much, because it's a tradition that's been around for centuries. Often when you look at windows, you can see the imagery of different people. Those uh, ancient painters put their brother-in-laws, their sisters, their wives, their dogs into the windows, things that were personal to them. So when I paint a window, I try to make it personal to myself as well, as well as being the proper thing to put in a particular church or, or institution. So today I have this seraphim. Uh, I made it for uh, a Christmas. Uh, every Christmas I make some small panels. And uh, seraphim is the highest order of angels, so it has eight wings and it just circles around its being. Um, I started with a drawing. This is the drawing right here. And it's a pencil drawing that I start out with to get the details of what I want. And uh, I don't put all the shading and everything in my original pencil drawing. I let that come to me unless it's a, sp a particular person, then I will do all the shading beforehand. If it has to look like a particular person, in this case it doesn't. So I just let the sh shading and imagery uh, come later, a little more free form. After I have the pencil drawing, what I do is that I make a pattern. So I place the pattern over top of the pencil uh, drawing and with a light table, I can see where I want to cut the glass. So this becomes my pattern for my glass cutting. After I have my pattern, then I'll cut all my pieces of glass out. And today I have just a couple of pieces to show you. I have a wing and the face, which I'll paint on. Now, the paint that we use uh, for doing painting on glass, again, is a very traditional uh, mix. It's a mix of leads and uh, uh, borates and all sorts of things. It is quite uh, dangerous. You don't want to inhale it. You don't want to eat it. So you have to have very good uh, safety uh, and uh, hygiene with it. Uh, it comes in a powder. This particular paint is made in Colorado by Rouché Company. It's the uh, company I like to use the most because its uh, paint is ground very fine. So when you mix it, you can get a really nice uh, consistency. Uh, Today, uh, I'm just going to use black. I use a lot of black, but paint does come in different sorts of brown and green shades, but not color. Uh, when you see colored paint on glass, that means that the paint is an enamel. Enamels are unlike traditional glass stains in that enamels are actually powdered glass, and when they're fired onto the glass, they just sit on the surface where the traditional paints actually stain or uh, are invasive to the actual surface of the glass. That's the difference between enamels and traditional paints. 
so we're using traditional paints today. So it's just black, or as I said, brown. Enamels are the colors that you see in paints. So I have a bit of uh, just uh, powdered paint in this container. I like to use these particular uh, ways of mixing it because it's much, it's much easier to mix it and also the paint stays fresher when it's in a container. Traditionally, you would mix the glass on a piece of, of glass, the glass paint on a piece of glass with a mull. But I find that the paint dried out too fast, so I think that this idea is, works better. I'm going to add some gum arabic to the mixture. Now the gum arabic, what it does is that it enables the glass paint to stick to the glass. Gum arabic is used in many kinds of paint uh, and it just is a binder. You can get uh, gum arabic in a powdered form, that's what it's mostly available in and use it the same way. So I have gum arabic and paint in there and now the only other ingredient I need is water. Now your liquid can be a few different things. Water of course is the easiest to get, easiest to use. There's lots of um, gossip of the history of painting on glass of the different kinds of fluids you can add to it to make it work. So the paint has to be ground so it becomes nice. and creamy and have a consistency that is kind of like thick cream. One of the beauties of making stained glass windows out of lead came is the fact that they can be taken apart every hundred years or so and put together with new lead came and essentially you have a brand new window. So here we are, we are taking a window out of a local Winnipeg home. And this is a real beautiful window, but as you can see, there are some problems. So this is the very bottom of the window and this is really common. All the way to the window often settles to the bottom. And of course that causes this bowing to happen. So you can see this window is actually folding along that bottom line there. Not a good sign. Also, if you look on top of that, you can see that there's a steel bar and uh, that steel bar is supposed to be attached to the window. But in this case, um, it is pulled away and is no longer performing its proper function. You can see that a little better in this picture. On here, you can see where there is a hole on top of that bar. That bar was originally inserted into that hole and it was in the frame. The idea with the bars is they're not only supposed to be attached to the window but they should be firmly embedded into the wooden or stone frame if it's an old church so that the weight of the window is transferred from the glass to the actual frame of the structure and you can see here at the top well again there's one bar that has separated and you can see how far it's it's sunk down in this window so there's almost an inch of space at the very top there where it's settled and you can see the leads pulled away from the top etc so this window has gotten to the point where it really needs to be taken apart and put together with some new lead came. So what we do once we get it to the shop is uh, first of all we'll make a pattern. And what we do is we put a piece of paper on top of the window and we take a rubbing. And what that basically means is we take a piece of either lead, lead from a pencil or we take a, a dirty piece of, of lead came and we rub on top, we put the paper on top of the glass and then we rub so that we can get a marking of where the actual lead is. And then as you can see, we can pull this apart. And when you get a good look at this, you can see how the lead is very brittle. It's very dry. And you can see how it's folded at the bottom. And it's really just reached the end of its life expectancy. So here we've got the window put together with some brand new lead came. We use the same width of lead. Uh, we have pretty good access to, to lead came, so we can get pretty much the same dimension material as they used in the old days. It's kind of interesting when you look at this window flat like this, you can see the background, the back side of the border is really large pieces of glass with silver stain on the back. And silver stain is, a, is basically, it's a silver material which is made into a powder which we can mix with a, with a fixative. 
and it can come in slightly different shades depending on how intense the, the silver uh, component is. So you can get really light gold, you can get really dark gold, and you can get some really nice brown uh, pieces. So this is just a beautiful version, our example of the face on this piece. Wonderful, wonderful painting. I love the little brooch with, with the, the face on it. And this is just a, such a wonderful face on this particular model. And here we see the, the window back in place. You can see that it's nice and clean, everything's straight. We put new rebars on it so that it's uh, properly embedded into the frame. And this window should be good for another 100 years. Now we got our paint all mixed, we have to test it to make sure it's the right consistency. And the easiest way to test it is to use it. So I'm going to put on a piece of glass and the first thing I'm looking for is evenness of color. And I see that it's getting a little bit faded here so it's not quite as thick as I want it to be. Almost there. But I'm going to let it dry and see what happens. The thing about painting on glass, because you are using leads and oxides, it's, it is very important to keep yourself clean. Um, I generally always wear an apron and, and painting clothes. Uh, you notice that my hands are already dirty. You have to make sure you don't put your hands in your mouth. That's the easiest way to get any sort of lead poisoning. And uh, never drink. Uh, beverage or smoke or do anything like that while you're working with this uh, particular kind of material. The only person I ever knew that got lead poisoning was a smoker. They smoked while they were painting. So I see that my, my paint is starting to dry and if I move a paintbrush or a here I'll make it easier to see uh, stick through the, the paint. I see it's not dry here yet, it's dry there. But what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a consistency that allows me to pull this through and when I get rid of the dry paint it's a nice even line. That means I have just the correct amount of gum arabic in my mix. If I pulled through and I had resistance to, to the stick then I know that I had too much gum arabic or if I pulled through and I get in, didn't get a nice clear line that means that I had not enough, it was too soft. So you don't want it to be too soft, you don't want it to be too hard, you want it to be just right. And you do need the gum arabic to make sure that the paint will stick to the glass. One really important part of uh, painting on glass is making sure your glass is entirely clean before you start adding paint to it. And the easiest and best way to get your glass clean is to put paint on it and then use the paint as a scrub to clean the glass. Now the glass is very, very clean. The kind of brushes that you use to apply the paint are called liners. And a liner brush is uh, very uh, specific. It has got a very long uh, brush length so that it will hold the paint all the way along so that when you apply it to the glass, it will make a long line so that you can have the ability to paint. It really depends how close you hold your, your paintbrush to the glass or how far away for the width of your line. This particular brush I have is really nice. I bought it in London, England. And uh, they are, my brushes are my prized possessions. You have to be really careful when you have a good brush that you don't leave it sitting in your cup like that because that really damages the bristles. Always make sure you have them sitting parallel. And if you use my brushes and you don't leave them sitting parallel, you might as well just go home and because uh, you're in big trouble. So I have all these lines on here. I notice that the consistency of my paint is looking pretty good because I have much more even uh, where it's dry. 
I can cut it. Oh, you see, it's, it's good. It's got a, a very good consistency. Now, people ask me, how, how can I know if I have the right amount of gum arabic? And there are some particular uh, measurements, but it really depends how much water you're planning on, on, on adding and uh, how you're mixing it, too. But generally, it's about a 20 to 1. So now I know my paint is working well. I'm just going to show you different techniques of applying the paint. So this was a line. Uh, the other tool I use a lot is called a stippler. And I'm a tiny bit uh, famous for stippling because uh, it's what I use a lot. And what it does is that it changes a line into something with movement. So this is how you create the different movement in the wings and how you create drapery in pieces uh, when you want to do uh, windows, religious windows. We do a lot of work for churches and uh, you can see our work all over Winnipeg and in Ontario and in rural Manitoba. I've learned a lot about how to paint actually from doing repairs. Repairs teach me how people have applied paint in old windows and uh, just different techniques. Okay, well I think the paint's working well. It's working well in both instances. This doesn't look like too much now, but it's pretty amazing what you can do by removing paint, make wings, make waves. Okay, so now I know that I've got the correct uh, kind of consistency. I'm going to paint my face here. And the face is just all line work. There's no shading. And it's very simple. You just have to follow your pattern, your design. Make sure that your brush is nicely loaded. And it just takes a nice even hand and a bit of practice. Quite a bit of practice. But anybody that knows how to paint with other mediums can catch on to this pretty easily. So once I have this painted, it has to be fired in a kiln. And the temperature that the traditional paints like to be fired at is around 1175 degrees Fahrenheit. You want to keep it at 1175 because if you fire it any higher, you're going to destroy the texture of your glass. Um, and you want to keep your uh, texture and life of your glass as, as, as good as possible. You don't want to get rid of all the little bubbles and imperfections. So once this is painted, it would be fired in the kiln. And once all the pieces were painted and fired, then it would be either put together with copper foil or with lead. In the late 1800s, there were two artists who stood above all their contemporaries when it came to stained glass in the United States. First of all, there was Louis Comfort Tiffany, who we all have most likely heard of. But there's also another unsung hero. His name was John Lafarge. 
Both of them came from artistic backgrounds. They were both painters. As you can see, here's a beautiful landscape that John Lafarge did. But they had ambitions way beyond just doing oil painting and watercolors. They also were very interested in many other arts. So this is a drawing that John Lafarge did, which you can see has a very much a stained glass kind of approach to it. There's just the way he placed everything, the coloring, the, the shape obviously was something that he had done as a drawing for a church window. You can see how something like that would be taken. And this is one of his larger stained glass commissions. And when we look at this one, it is very European in style. The hands are painted, the faces are painted, the arms, all the different flesh is painted. And it's a fairly flat looking piece. A lot of the glass is very much as you would expect to see in a European stained glass piece. However, now we can start seeing him bringing some of his own personality into here. You can see the peacock on the right, very, very detailed, and especially around the top, very detailed also. Now the glass has become much more important. Now the reason that he and Tiffany were thought of in the same breath quite often is because they were both experimenting with two different versions of stained glass. First of all, opalescent glass. You can see these are completely made of opalescent glass. There's no painting, there's no other uh, treatments that are making these such stunning windows. And second of all, he used a lot of what was called copper foil. So you can see in the highlight here, this is from the tail of the peacock. These pieces are smaller than your thumbnail. And rather than trying to wrap lead around them, what Lafarge did, and Tiffany did at the same time, so we don't really know who actually came up with the idea first, was wrapping the pieces in copper foil and then soldering over the copper foil to hold all the glass in place. So this allowed them to get some incredible detail in their pieces. Now this piece, again, another color masterpiece. It's very difficult to see in this slide, but the next one will show you a little more. If you look in the bottom section between the different figures, you can see all those dots of glass. What they are is small glass nuggets. On the left and the right side of these pillars, those are all round glass nuggets. They're actually about 3 eighths of an inch thick. They are formed in the kiln. They're basically, you, you cut squares of, of glass, you put them in the kiln, heat them up, and they will automatically go round it. And you can see the beautiful shading these got in here. And again, the incredible detail that he's got in here. Very little images, very simple. I mean, the image itself is just the pillars, but all those wonderful pieces of, of glass nuggets or, or globs as they're often called, must, have, must just sparkle when you see them in natural sunlight. This is a drawing he did. Again, you can see very simple hollyhock design, but it lent itself extremely well to stained glass. As we can see here with this peony window, you can imagine how he took one of his drawings like the last one we looked at and used them as a basis for uh, this one, which was probably his most famous one. I have a, a beautiful poster of this called Peonies Blowing in the Wind. So I would highly recommend if you have uh, a few extra moments, check out John Lafarge, wonderful artist and a great stained glass craftsman. I mentioned before that stains are either black or brown or some sorts of green, but I failed to mention, and will mention now, that the other stain is silver stain. And silver stain turns glass gold. So when the French were making their windows at, at uh, La Chapelle and Chartres Cathedral, they realized that if they used a silver stain with blue and green and red glass, which were available to them, you could create all different sorts of colors. So they used all the primary colors to get the big jewel tones you see. Silver stain's a little different than the other stains in that it's the last thing you generally use. And it's always put on the opposite side of the glass than the other paints because it will interfere so what you do is you paint this side first and fire it and then turn it over and put your silver stain on it and fire it. Silver stain likes to be fired around 1100 degrees, which is less than the traditional paint. Uh, silver stain is very invasive. So if you use it in your kiln, you have to make sure you have kiln shelf protection, etc. Because if a little bit of silver remains on your kiln shelf, you will see it in the rest of your glass for eternity. So you want to be very careful about how you set it and how you use it. Silver stain comes in a powder and it comes packed in uh, cardboard because it will eat through um, 
plastic. And in this case, it's also eating through the cardboard. So this uh, particular bag I've likely had for around 15 years. It, is, uh, it lasts forever and um, it is something that you just keep very preciously tucked away. And this is the palette I mix it up on. From the last time I used it, I can already see that there is a fair amount of stain in here, on here, so I'm just going to reconstitute it. Silver stain does not require gum arabic. It just requires water. So to reconstitute, I'll put a little bit of water down and mix it up. Now the piece of glass that I'm using is a piece of lightly sandblasted glass so that it has a bit of a tooth to it. So when I'm grinding it, I get some action. Now the color that you see is not the silver stain. The color you see is a binder that's used to uh, help you apply the silver stain. And it's, a, it's actually a clay. And the clay will hold the particles of the silver stain so that you can apply it. Otherwise, it's, it's very difficult to apply. And when you fire it, the clay will just stay on the glass and you wash it off after. So once you got it nice and creamy, mixed up, then you can apply it. It isn't like the other paint, it really doesn't uh, go on nicely with a brush. So generally when you apply it to your piece, you take an applicator brush, and this is a nice old brush that I inherited from a uh, stained glass painter, Ernest Ashcroft, very, very fine artist, and you apply the silver stain onto your glass. Now the silver stain will be where it's applied. In this case, I applied it and then I cut it with a, by wiping its edges to get the circle. So you want to wipe it while it's still wet if you want to change the shape. So this is really good. We use it in a lot of our religious windows to add uh, just a little bit of gold and detail to things. So that's, a, that's how you apply it. And it's not the easiest thing to get nice and even. But once this is fired, it will turn into a moderately even surface. The proceeding was an independently produced community access program. The viewpoints expressed are those of the community access producer and do not reflect those of Shaw Cable Systems. The program is presented in response to CRTC policy guidelines regulating community programming.